Personally, I disagree with the word opera in connection with Gilbert and Sullivan. It's misleading. Comic opera is better, but I would prefer to see them alluded to as musical plays, musical comedies, musical topsy-turvy rahs, if you like. But opera, no. I'm sure that there are many people who are kept away from them by that one word alone. Radio Features presents Winnow All My Folly, a profile of Doily Cart Opera Company star Martin Green. Winnow All My Folly. I'm wisdom from the east and from the west, that's subject to no academic rule. You may find it in the jeering of a jest, or distill it from the folly of a fool. I can teach you with a quip if I've a mind I can trick you into learning with a laugh Oh, win all my folly, folly, folly And you'll find a grain or two of truth among the chaff Oh, win all my folly, folly, folly And you'll find a grain or two of truth among the chaff The wisdom of a jester, the voice of an artist Born in London in 1899, William Martin Green studied singing with his father, William Green, a well-known tenor of the day, before enrolling as a pupil of Gustav Garcia at the Royal College of Music in 1919, following demobilisation from the army. The 20-year-old had received shrapnel wounds in his left leg during World War I, but was recovered well enough in a year or so to make his stage debut on the theatrical touring circuit. More shows followed. While appearing in a musical review in Stoke Newington, he ran into an old friend, Ethel McLelland, who was singing principal soprano roles with the Doily Cart New Opera Company. I think you'd do quite well in Gilbert and Sullivan, she remarked. Exit on cue, young hopeful, headed for the Savoy Hotel to arrange an audition with Rupert Doily Cart. Engaged, he joined the chorus in November 1922. Before the month was over, the company member named as Lewis in the gondoliers was Martin Green, his first principal part. As his career burgeoned, the talented newcomer was to become the main understudy to the then great star of GNS comedy roles, Sir Henry Lytton. There's a nigger, said a I, and the other of his race, the piano organist. Well, I've got him on the list. All people who eat peppermint and puff it in your face, they never would be missed. They never would be missed. And the idiot who praises with enthusiastic tone. All centuries but this and every country but his own. And the lady from the provinces who dresses like a guy. And who does think she dances but would rather like to try. And that singular anomaly, the prohibitionist. Well, I don't think he'd be missed. I'm sure he'd not be missed. He's got him on the list. He's got him on the list. And I got him with his list. I'm sure he's not be missed. Sir Henry Lytton as Coco, the Lord High Executioner in the Mikado, enumerating some of the victims who appear on his little list. You will have noticed the bowel Sir Henry using the N-word. Although I had appeared in the role of Coco many times, I received, after the latest opening, several letters objecting to my use of the word nigger in my first song. Mr. Cart, apparently, also received some similar objections and asked me to think out some word to take its place. The allusion was not, I am sure, intended to be interpreted as an allusion to any race, but to the old-time minstrel shows, the nigger minstrels. And I based my selection of the word I would use on that, my selected word being minstrel. It scanned, and what was more, to my mind, kept the same meaning while avoiding the giving of any offence. I received a letter from Cart telling me he wished me to use the words banjo serenader. I wrote telling him that I was already using minstrel, and couldn't help feeling it was more in keeping with the original intention, to which he replied that he still wished me to use banjo, and that word was being printed in all new editions of the libretto. I used and continue to use the word banjo. Whatever about that controversy, Martin Green excelled in the comic role of Coco, the ex-jailbird, Lord High Executioner of Titipu. Let's listen to him convey the character's mellower side in wooing the formidable Katisha through the plaintive tale of Titwillow. On a tree by a river, a little Tom Tit sang willow, tit willow, tit willow. And I said to him, Dicky Bird, why do you sit singing willow, tit willow, tit willow? 
Is it weakness of intellect, birdie, I cried, or a rather tough worm in your little inside? With a shake of his poor little head, he replied, Oh, willow, tit willow, tit willow. He slept at his chest as he sat on that bough, singing willow, tit willow, tit willow. And a cold perspiration bespangled his brow, oh willow, tit willow, tit willow. He sobbed and he sighed, and a gurgle he gave. Then he plunged himself into the billowy wave. And an echo arose from the suicide's grave. Oh, willow, tit willow, tit willow. Now I feel just as sure as I'm sure that my name isn't willow, tit willow, tit willow. That was blighted affection that made him exclaim, oh willow, tit willow, tit willow. And if you remain callous and obdurate, I shall perish as he did. And you will know why, though I probably shall not exclaim as I die. Oh, willow, tit willow, tit willow. Early in 1922, I was taking a stroll through Piccadilly one Saturday afternoon when I ran across a fellow student, Bernard Smith. He asked me what I was doing and would I like to go to the Prince's Theatre with him. I asked him what he was going to see and he told me the Doily Cart Opera Company. I wasn't feeling very much like opera, I told him, but he insisted I would enjoy it, so I gave in. During the gondoliers, as the opera was called, both of us were very nearly thrown out for creating a disturbance. I had never in my life heard anything so funny as the Grand Inquisitor saying, because a Lord High Chancellor should never place himself in the position of being told to uh, tuck in his tuppany. And, of course, I began to laugh. And that was my first introduction to both Gilbert and Sullivan and Gilbert and Sullivan audiences. I could not understand an audience that didn't want to laugh at something funny. I didn't realize that 99.9% of them already knew it by heart and were quite prepared not only to shush me and my friend, but to prompt any of the performers on stage if he should fluff. Green didn't play the Grand Inquisitor in The Gondoliers, a bass baritone part. However, on promotion from Lewis, he did entertain audiences as the dodgy Duke, who forms himself and his equally dodgy Duchess into a limited liability company, the Duke of Plaza Toro Limited. To help unhappy commoners and add to their enjoyment, affords a man of noble rank congenial employment. Of our attempts we offer you examples illustrative. The work is light and, I may add, it's most remunerative. Small titles and orders for mayors and recorders I get and they're highly delighted. They're highly delighted. MPs, baronetted, sham colonels, gazetted, and second-rate aldermen knighted. Yes, aldermen knighted. Foundation stone laying I find very paying. It adds a large sum to my making. Large sum to his making. At charity dinners, the best of speech spinners, I get 10% on the takings. One-tenth of the takings. I present any lady whose conduct is shady or smacking of doubtful propriety. Doubtful propriety. When virtue would quash her, I take and fight and wash her and launch her in first-rate society. First-rate society. I recommend acres of clumsy dressmakers, their pit and their finishing touches. Their finishing touches. A song in addition, they pay for permission to say that they make for the Duchess. They make for the Duchess. 
Those pressing prevailers, the ready-made tailors, quote me as their great double barrel. Their great double barrel. I allow them to do so, though Robinson Crusoe would jib at their wearing apparel. Such wearing apparel. I sit by selection upon the direction of several companies' bubble. All companies' bubble. As soon as they're floated, I'm freely banknoted. I'm pretty well paid for my trouble. He's paid for his trouble. At middle cost party, I play at a cutty, and I'm by no means a beginner. She's not a beginner. To one of my station, the remuneration, five in is a night and my dinner. And wine with her dinner. I write letters blatant on medicine's patent and use any other you mustn't. Believe me, you mustn't. And for my complexion derives its perfection from somebody's soap, which it doesn't. It certainly doesn't. We're ready as witness to anyone's fitness to fill any place or preferment. A place or preferment. We are often in waiting at junket or painting and sometimes a tendon in torment. We enjoy an interment. In short, if you kindle the spark of a swindle, your simple comes into your clutches, gets into your clutches. Or who wink a debtor, you cannot do better than cut out a duke or a duchess. A duke or a duchess. Not a brown envelope in sight. All safely pocketed, Martin Green and Ella Hallman. And here they are, Plaza Toro's plus daughter now, giving lessons in royal etiquette to the two gauche pretenders to the throne of Barataria. A courtier grave and serious who is about to kiss your hand Try to combine a pose imperious with a demeanor nobly bland Let us combine a pose imperious with a demeanor nobly bland That's if anything too unbending, too aggressively stiff and grand now to the other extreme you're tending Don't be so deucedly condescending Now to the other extreme you're tending Don't be so deucedly condescending Oh, hard to please some noblemen seem I can't if anything to unbending Off we go to the other extreme To confound now a gavot perform sedately Offer your hand with conscious pride Take an attitude not too stately Still sufficiently dignified Now for an attitude not too stately Still sufficiently dignified Once Twicely, oncely, twicely, how impressively there you glide. Capital both, capital both, you've caught it nicely. That is the style of king, precisely. Capital both, capital both, you've caught it nicely. That is the style of king, precisely. Oh, see, to honor the women's race. Capital both, capital both, you've caught it nicely. Supposing he's right in what he says, this is the style of him precisely. Oh, that is the style of him
Henry Luton gave his farewell performance in Dublin's Gaiety Theatre on the 30th of June 1934, whereupon who became his successor as the leading player of the GNS comic patter roles? Correct. I was appearing as Major General Stanley in Pirates. Henry Lytton sat in the royal box. As students of the operas well know, the first thing the Major General does, with the exception of two very short lines, is to break right into the tongue-twisting patter song, I am the very model of a modern Major General. My mouth was as dry as a tinderbox. In fact, I was so dry, I couldn't have spit a thruppenny bit. I breathed a silent prayer as my cue came and stepped onto the stage, hoping that my legs would continue to support me and that my knees would not rattle too audibly. As the second encore came to an end, I breathed another silent prayer, this time of gratitude. Gratitude for the sword, which is part of the costume, and which is held in front of one, point on the ground and hands resting on top of the hilt, thus affording me a third leg, so to speak. Without it, I am perfectly certain I would have gone head over heels into the orchestra pit. I am the very model of a modern major general. I have information, vegetable, animal, and mineral. I know the kings of England like to quote the fight historical from Marathon to Waterloo in order categorical. I'm very well acquainted too with matters mathematical. I understand equations both the simple and quadratical. About binomial theorem, I am teeming with a lot of news. You, oh, lot of news, lot of news. Huh. With many cheerful facts about the square of the hypotenuse. <laughs> I'm very good at integral and differential calculus. I know the scientific names of beings and animalculus. In short, in matters vegetable, animal and mineral, I am the very model of a modern major general. I know our mythic history, King Arthur's answer caradox. I answer hard acrostic cyber pity taste of paradox. I quote an early jargs all the crimes of Heliogabalus. In Koenig's I can flaw peculiarities parabolus. I can tell undoubted Raphael's from Gerard Dawson's Ophanes. I know the croaking chorus from the frogs of Aristophanes. Then I can hum a few of which I've heard the music's dinner for. Yeah, oh, dinner for, dinner for. Ah, and whistle all the airs in that infernal nonsense pinafore. Whistle all the airs in that infernal nonsense pinafore. Whistle all the airs in that infernal nonsense pinafore. Whistle all the airs in that infernal nonsense pinafore. Whistle all the airs in that then I can write a washing bill in Babylonic uniform and give you every detail of Caractacus's uniform. In short, and matters vegetable, animal and mineral, I am the very model of a modern major general. In fact, when I know what is meant by mammalon and ravelin, when I can tell at sight a mouse a rifle from a javelin, when such affairs are sorties and surprises I'm more wary at, and when I know precisely what is meant by commissariat, when I have learnt what progress has been made in modern gunnery. When I know more of tactics than a novice in a nunnery. In short, when I have a smattering of elemental strategy. <sighs> oh, strategy, strategy, fatigy, matagy, batagy, sa- Ah, I have it. You'll say a better Major General has never sat a G. Of a military knowledge, though I'm plucky and adventurous, has only been brought down to the beginning of the century. But still, in matters vegetable, animal, and mineral, I am the very model of a modern major general. <laughs> um, Bashta, he's a walking weapon of mass instruction, I tell you. Martin Green as Major General Stanley in The Pirates of Penzance. The fields of Elysium rather than those of battle would seem to be the preferred theatre of dreams for the poetic Reginald Bumporn in patience until alone and unobserved, except of course by the entire audience, he admits to being an aesthetic sham and supplies some pointers on the art of posturing. If you're anxious for to shine in the high aesthetic line as a man of culture rare, you must get up all the germs of the transcendental terms and plant them everywhere. You must lie upon the daisies and discourse in novel phrases of your complicated state of mind. The meaning doesn't matter if it's only idle chatter of a transcendental kind. And everyone will say, as you walk your mystic way, if this young man expresses himself in terms too deep for me, 
Why, what a very singularly deep young man this deep young man must be. Be eloquent in praise of the very dull old days which have long since passed away. And convince them, if you can, that the reign of good Queen Anne was culture's palmiest day. Of course you will poo-poo whatever's fresh and new and declare it's crude and mean. For art stopped short in the cultivated court of the Empress Josephine. And everyone will say, as you walk your mystic way, if that's not good enough for him, which is good enough for me, why, what a very cultivated kind of youth this kind of youth must be. Then a sentimental passion of a vegetable fashion must excite your language spleen. An attachment a la Plato for a bashful young potato or a not too French French bean. Though the Philistines may jostle, you will rank as an apostle in the high aesthetic band. If you walk down Piccadilly with a puppy or a lily in your medieval hand. And everyone will say, as you walk your flowery way, if he's content with a vegetable love, which would certainly not suit me, why, what a most particularly pure young man this pure young man must be. A how-to on impressing the culture vultures. From Patience, Gilbert's satire on what he saw as the Wildean cult of the aesthetic. A little while ago we heard the Major General award himself brownie points for being able to whistle all the airs from that infernal nonsense pinafore. Well, here's one of them, our Mr Green this time donning his navy uniform. <laughs> When I was a lad, I served a term as office boy to an attorney's firm. I cleaned the windows and I swept the floor and I polished up the handle of the big front door. I polished up the handle of the big front door. I polished up that handle so carefully that now I am the ruler of the Queen's Navy. I polished up the handle so carefully that now I am the ruler of the Queen's Navy. As office boy, I made such a mark that they gave me the post of a junior clerk. I served the writs with a smile so bland, and I copied all the letters in a big round hand. I copied all the letters in a big round hand. I copied all the letters in a hand so free that now I am the ruler of the Queen's Navy. He copied all the letters in a hand so free that now he is the ruler of the Queen's In serving writs I made such a name that an articled clerk I soon became. I wore clean collars and a brand new suit for the pass examination at the institute. For the pass examination at the institute. That pass examination did so well for me that now I am the ruler of the Queen's Navy. That pass examination did so well for me that now I am the ruler of the Queen's Navy. Of legal knowledge I acquired such a grip that they took me into the partnership and the junior partnership I ween was the only ship I ever had seen. Was the only ship we ever had seen. But that kind of ship so suited me that now I am the ruler of the Queen's Navy. But that kind of ship so suited me that now he is the ruler of the Queen's Navy. I grew so rich that I was sent by a pocket borough into Parliament. I always voted at my party's call. I never thought of thinking for myself at all. He never thought of thinking for myself at all. I thought so little. They rewarded me by making me the ruler of the Queen's Navy. He thought so little. They rewarded me by making me the ruler of the Queen's Navy. Now, landsmen all, whoever you may be, if you want to rise to the top of the tree, if your soul isn't fettered to an office stool, be careful to be guided by this golden rule. Be careful to be guided by this golden rule. Stick close to your desks and never go to sea. 
And you all may be rulers of the Queen's Navy. Way ahead here, boy. Sir Joseph Porter's recipe for ultimate career advancement from HMS Pinafore. Back now to that initial experience of Gilbert and Sullivan when Martin Green was taken by his friend Bernard Smith to a performance of The Gondoliers. When the curtain fell, we made our way out to the street and there was no hesitation in my voice when I replied yes to Bernard's question as to whether I would like to see another of the operas and he suggested The Yeoman of the Guard. We went the following week. To say I was moved was putting it mildly. I was intensely moved and very impressed with Henry Lytton's performance of Jack Point. As we left the theatre, I said to Bernard, what a part, what a performance, what wouldn't I give to play that part? If ever you do, he said, I'll come to see you in it. In Leeds, in 1932, he did. I have a song to sing, oh. Sing me a song, oh. It is sung to the moon by a lovelorn loon who fled from the mocking throng, oh. It's the song of a merry man moping mum whose soul was sad and whose glance was glum, who sipped no sup and who craved no crumb as he sighed for the love of a lady. Lady, lady. Misery me, lack a lady. He sipped no sup, but he craved no crumb as he sighed for the love of a lady. I have a song to sing. Oh. What is your song? Oh? It is sung with the ring of a song's maid sing who love with a love life long. Oh, it's a song of a merry maid, purely proud, who loved her lord and who laughed aloud at the moon. Of the merry man moping bum, whose soul was sad and whose glance was glum, who sipped no sup and who craved no crumb, as he sighed for the love of a lady. Lady, lady, misery me, like a lady. He sipped no sup and he craved no crumb, as he sighed for the love of a lady. I have a song to sing. Oh. sing It is sung to the knell of a churchyard bell and a doleful dirge ding dong. Oh, it's the song of a popinjay bravely born who turned up his noble nose with scorn at the humble merry maid, purely proud, who loved a lord and who laughed aloud at the moan of the merry man moping mum, whose soul was sad and whose glance was glum, who sipped no sup and who craved no crumb as he sighed for the love of a lady. Hady, hady. Misery me, lack a lady. He sipped no sup and he craved no crumb as he sighed for the love of a lady. I have a song to sing. Oh. Sing me your song. Oh. It is sung with a sigh and a tear in the eye, for it tells of a right and wrong. Oh, it's a song of a merry maid once so gay who turned on a heel and tripped away from the peak of Coventry, bravely born, who turned up his noble nose with scorn at the humble heart that he did not prize. So she begged on her knees with downcast eyes for the love of a merry man, moping mum, whose soul was sad and whose glance was glum, who sipped no sup and who craved no crumb as he sighed for the love of a lady. Hey! Jack Point and partner Elsie Maynard, sung by Martin Green and Muriel Harding, performing for the crowd gathered outside the Tower of London, the story of the merry man and his maid, which gives the omen its subtitle and has a sadly ironic resonance for the relationship of the two strolling players. 
The Yeoman of the Guard and the role of the tragic jester, Jack Point, gave Martin Green the chance to show his great skill as an actor. Combining comedy and pathos, in for instance revealing the occupational hazards of a private buffoon. <laughs> A private buffoon is a light-hearted loon If you listen to popular rumour From the morn to the night He's so joyous and bright And he bubbles with wit and good humour He's so quaint and so terse Both in prose and in verse Yet though people forgive his transgression There are one or two rules That all family fools Must observe if they love the profession There are one or two rules Half a dozen maybe That all family fools Of whatever degree Must observe if they love their profession if you wish to succeed as a jester, you'll need to consider each person's auricular. What is all right for B would quite scandalize C, for C is so very particular. And D may be dull, and E's very thick skull is as empty of brains as a ladle. While F is F sharp, and will cry with a carp that he's known your best joke from his cradle. When your humor they flout, you can't let yourself go, and it does put you out when a person says, Oh, I've known that old joke from my cradle. If your master is surly from getting up early and tempers are short in a morning, an inopportune joke is enough to provoke him to give you at once a month's warning. Then if you refrain, he is at you again, for he likes to get value for money. He'll ask then and there, with an insolent stare, if you know that you're paid to be funny. Oh, it adds to the task of a merry man's place when his principal asks with a scowl on his face, if you know that you're paid to be funny. Comes a bishop, maybe, or a solemn D.D., or beware of his anger provoking. Better not pull his hair, don't stick pins in his chair, he don't understand practical joking. If the jest that you crack have an orthodox smack, you may get a bland smile from these sages. But should they by chance be imported from France, half a crown is stopped out of your wages. It's a general rule, or your zeal it may quench. If the family fool tells a joke that's too French, half a crown is stopped out of his wages. Though your head it may rack with a bilious attack And your senses with toothache you're losing Don't be mopey and flat, they don't find you for that If you're properly quaint and amusing Though your wife ran away with a soldier that day And took with her your trifle of money Bless your heart, they don't mind They're exceedingly kind they don't blame you so long as you're funny. It's a comfort to feel though your partner should fit. Though you suffer a deal, they don't mind it a bit. They don't blame you so long as you're funny. In the years since I first performed Gilbert and Sullivan, I have experienced most of the emotions that man is prone to. Great happiness, great sorrow. Tremendous elation and intense depression, hope and despair, pleasure, regret. Of the last, I have but few. If I had my life to live over again, I think I would spend it with but few exceptions as I have, singing and performing Gilbert and Sullivan, unless it had been performing Shakespeare. I say I think, because unless one is a seer and can look into the future, it is difficult to say what one could do. But of this I am pretty certain. I would have spent it on the stage. And we should be glad that on the stage is in fact how he did spend his life and that he made a series of wonderful recordings for us to enjoy today. Martin Green left the Doily Cart Company in 1951, worked in America, returned briefly to England to portray George Grossmith, the original patterol player, in the film The Story of Gilbert and Sullivan. In spite of a dreadful New York lift accident in 1959, which resulted in his left leg being amputated, he courageously went on to tour all over the United States in GNS roles, appeared on Broadway in films, and directed Groucho Marx, no less, in a TV production of The Mikado. His last stage appearance was in Chicago in 1974, and he died on the 8th of February, 1975. Martin Green was an accomplished musician, singing with impeccable diction every note and pronouncing every syllable of the patter songs, which, like his predecessors Grossmith and Lytton, he was to make his own. As to his baritone voice, it was never less than completely sympathetic, but also up to tackling the demands of a tongue-twisting, lung-busting number such as the one with which we take our leave.
Marvilla Square Marshin as the highly susceptible Lord Chancellor in Iolanthe, we encore Martin Green. <laughs> Unrequited robs me of me rest Love, hopeless love, my ardent soul encumbers Love, nightmare-like, lies heavy on me chest And weaves itself into my midnight slumber When you're lying awake with a dismal headache And repose is tabooed by anxiety I conceive you may use any language you choose To indulge him without impropriety For your brain is on fire The bedclothes conspired of usual slumber to plunder you First your counterpane goes and uncovers your toes Then your sheet slips demurely from under you The blanketing tickles you feel like mixed pickles So terribly sharp is the pricking You're hot and you're cross and you tumble and toss Till there's nothing to you and the ticking Then the bedclothes all creep to the ground in a heap And you pick them all up in a Angle. Next your pillow resigns and politely declines to remain at its usual angle. Well, you get some repose in the form of a doze with hot eyeballs and head ever aching. But your slumbering teams are such horrible dreams that you'd very much better be waking. For you dream you are crossing the channel and tossing about in a steamer from Harwich, which is something between a large bathing machine and a very small second-class carriage. And you're giving a treat, penny ice and cold meat, to a party of friends and relations. They're a ravenous horde and they all came on board a Sloan Square and some South Kensington stations And bound on that journey You'll find your attorney Who started that morning from Devon He's a bit undersized And you don't feel surprised When he tells you he's only eleven Well, you're driving like mad With this singular lad By the by, the ship's now a four-wheeler And you're playing round the games And he calls you bad names When you tell him the ties pay the dealer Well, this you can't stand So you throw up your hand And you find you're as cold as an icicle In your shirt and your socks The black silk with gold clocks Crossing Salisbury Plain on a bicycle And he and the crew are on bicycles to which they've somehow or other invested in and he's telling the tars or the particulars of a company he's interested in it's a scheme of devices to get at low prices all goods and cough mixtures to cables which tickle the sailors by treating retailers as though they were all vegetables you'll get a good spaceman to plant a small tradesman first take off his boots with a boot tree his legs will take root and his fingers will shoot and they'll blossom and bud like a fruit tree from the green grocery tree you get grapes and green pea cauliflower pineapple and cranberries the paste to cook plant cherry brandy will grow Apple puffs and three corners and bamboos. The shares are a penny and ever so many are taken by Rothschild and Baring. And just as a few were allotted to you, you awake with a shot of despairing. You're a regular wreck with a crick in your neck and no wonder you snore for your head from the floor and you needles and pins from your soles to your shins. Your flesh is a creep and your left legs asleep when you cramp on your toes and a fly on your nose. Some fluff in your lung and a feverish tongue and a thirst is intense and a general sense that you haven't been sleeping in clover. But the darkness has passed and is daylight at last. The night has been long, ditto, ditto, my song. And thank goodness they're both of That program was written by Fionn O'Leary and Jerry McArdle, who also read extracts from Martin Green's autobiography. Here's a How Do You Do? Winnow All My Folly was presented by Fionn O'Leary and produced by Jerry McArdle. I've wisdom from the East and from the West That's subject to no academic rule You may find it in the jeering of a jest Or distill it from the folly of a fool I can teach you with a quip if I've a mind I can trick you into learning with a laugh Oh, winnow all my folly, folly, folly And you'll find a grain or two of truth among the chaff Oh, winnow all my folly, folly, folly And you'll find a grain or two of truth among the chaff